Stanford University where I helped direct the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the Brown Institute is a collaboration between Stanford University School of Engineering and Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. We endeavor to support media innovation both in developing new technologies and content. The Institute was founded through a generous gift from longtime cosmopolitan editor Helen Gurley Brown, whose husband, film producer David Brown, was a graduate of both uh, universities. At Brown, much in the spirit of this conference, we look for ideas that are original and have the potential to bring to in true innovation to the media world. To achieve our goals, the Institute funds several annual magic grants uh, to support small teams in bringing their ideas to life by implementing a prototype, creating an innovative media project, or telling stories in a new way. So I say all that just to let you know that these collaborations can happen not just across journalism and computer science, but even between different schools and different coasts. Today, our session, uh, we're going, today in our session, we're going to take up again the puzzle of trust and uh, take up the question of how to unpack the fact-checking challenge. We will hear from uh, four presenters today who will pick up where we left off yesterday and discuss new methods and practices to tackle fact-checking, largely addressing issues uh, on the back end. We'll hear more about ways to use technology to fight technology. Um, our guests will tell us about new ways to potentially automate what for many practi practitioners is a labor-intensive and costly process. And we're going to learn about what methods and metrics are working, uh, what's not, and we'll hear more. So let me introduce them. First, we will be hearing from Namil Hassan, who is an assistant professor in the Computer and Information Science Department at the University of Mississippi, also known as Ole Miss. He has interests in research areas related to database and data mining. His specific focus is on computational journalism, multi-dimensional opt optimization, and natural language processing. He has published widely in a host of prestigious venues. Before coming to, the Ol to Ole Miss in 2016, he received a PhD in computer science from the University of Texas at Arlington, and this is his fourth participation in the Computational and Journalism Symposium. So welcome. Joining him is Mohammed Youssef, who is a lecturer at the Gaylord College of Journalism at the University of Oklahoma, where he received his PhD. Um, Mohammed was a uh, practicing journalist in Bangladesh for eight years before coming to uh, the university. He teaches classes in journalism and programming, and his research interests are in the area of um, media competition. Next, we'll be hearing from Aditya Raghunathan, who is a project manager and instructor at Sense, Sensibility and Science, a UC Berkeley Big Ideas course on critical thinking group decision making, and applied rationality. A recent graduate of Berkeley, Aditya has applied his physics training and interdisciplinary problem solving skills to develop counterterrorism counter techniques for the FBI, create content for the howglobalwarmingworks.org website, and train entrepreneurs in India on decision making techniques. <laughs> Known for bringing creativity and enthusiasm to all his endeavors, Aditya serves as the youngest area director of Toastmasters Founders District and is currently working on expanding the scope of SSS to new avenues including medical schools, law schools, international universities, and news media. Finally, we will hear from Takis Metaxas who is a professor of computer science and the faculty director of the Albright Institute for Global Affairs at Wellesley College. Takis has taught at Dartmouth College and has spent his sabbaticals at MIT, the University of Sydney in Australia, the Center for Research on Computational and Society at Harvard, uh, and next spring he will be at the Center for Technology and Global Affairs at Oxford. He has long been interested in the changing ways we are being informed and misinformed, especially through social media. In 2003, he published a paper entitled, Of Course It's True, I Saw It on the Internet. In 2005, he published a paper entitled, Propaganda, Web Span, and Trust. 
And in 2011, he published a paper entitled How Not to Predict Elections. His research on the online propagation of mis misinformation has been extensively covered in the news and honored with several NSF grants uh, and four Best Paper Awards. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Okay, would you guys like to kick it off? Hi everyone, raise your hand if you think there is a need for a sustainable model for fact-checking platforms. Cool, you just validated our motivation for the project. <laughs> okay, so let me introduce our team. I'm Naimul Hassan from University of Mississippi. This work is uh, inter-university cross-domain work between computer science and journalism department of Ole Miss and uh, journalism department from uh, University of Oklahoma. So <clears throat> the graph here, the figure here you see, is um, the inactive fact-checking platforms worldwide, OK? So we have about, let's say, 63 inactive black fact-checking platforms, which contribute to 33% of all the fact-checking organizations. Okay. We wonder why they just become inactive or why they get closed. Fact-checking is labor-intensive, it's time-consuming, it's expensive. And sometimes the fact-checking platforms, they cannot take donation from anybody, okay, from anywhere. In, uh, by nature, fact-checking has to be impartial. So the donation which they take needs to come from uh, uh, neutral sources as well. It's less scalable and funding is often tied to, let's say, election or some other major events. So what can be a sustainable model for fact-checking? Okay, so if you ask myself, I don't know, okay? But we can question ourselves, is the combination of crowd professionals and automation can create a kind of seed for a sustainable fact-checking platform? Let me give you an introduction of how we kind of started the whole project. Uh, I teach computer journalism uh, in the University of Mississippi. In the spring semester, I did it for the first time. It was a small group, five from computer science, five from journalism. And we started this as a kind of a group project with two computer science students and one uh, journalism student. And uh, we wanted to see the activities going on in Reddit. There is a political fact-checking subreddit whose purpose is to do fact-checking using the crowd. Okay, so it's a totally crowd-sourced base. So just like any other uh, subreddit, this is the UI of political fact-checking. You see the, the crowd are posting uh, fact-check request, and the crowd is giving comments, and there is a set of moderators who monitor the evidences provided by the crowd, and based on these evidences, they provide flair whether this is true, false, unverifiable, and so on. And you may ask, uh, crowds sometimes go out of the topic. Sometimes they give uh, irrelevant posts. But we see very insightful evidence contain arguments as well. This is just an example of comment given for the claim where it says global warming is almost entirely neutral study confirms. Okay. All right, so uh, the data that we collected is for five years, from 2012 till 2017. We have about 500 fact check requests, about 10,000 comments, including the sub-comments, and there are about 10,000 uh, users in, or members in the political, uh, political fact checking, five moderators, and uh, there, you know there is an 80-20 rule or 80-30 rule. Most of the contributions are coming from 30% or 28% of the members. Now, what's the rating system? So uh, we have like confirmed, mostly true, true, uh, mostly false, false, prediction bias, and unverifiable. 
the figure there shows the distribution of fact check flares or ratings given to the fact checks. So we see that <coughs> false is one of the most common fact check uh, flare they assign. This figure here shows the activities uh, in, the, uh, sub, uh, in the subreddit platform. So in your time period, in the first, time, in the first uh, year, we see there is a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of activities, and then it kind of became less active. But it became stable, and it is kind of there. In, uh, for, uh, in, uh, the, during the elections, we see kind of the uprise here and there. Okay. So we have the data, we have the post and the comments from the subreddit. We wanted to analyze from multiple angles. For the fact check request, we wanted to see what is the topic that the people are trying to fact check. We got uh, 12 most prominent topics from one of the Pew Research, for example, economy, immigration, and so on. We assigned, uh, we manually go through the, com the post, the linked actual article, and then we assign what is the actual topic they want to fact check. We want to see uh, what is the type of that <coughs> fact check request, or of that post. Is it a fact check request, or this is just an irrelevant post, or this is just a request for some seeking information or others? What is the source of the fact? Is it coming from Fox, CNN? Is it coming from Breitbart? Is it coming from YouTube or any other user-generated content? What is the entity which is being fact-checked here? Is it a person, for example, Barack Obama or Donald Trump? Is it an organization? Is it kind of a policy or what? And the nature of the fact, is it statistical, code, media, like image or video or et cetera? For the comments, we want to see what are the actions that the crowd provide. For example, do they, provide argument? Do they provide factual evidence? Do they provide irrelevant stuff? And what are the evidences, what are the source of the evidences which they provide? Or is this source coming from PolyFact, Wikipedia, Breitbart, or what else? So the first question, uh, what claims do people want to see fact check? Okay. So we have about 12 uh, topics uh, of those uh, uh, fact check requests. And about 70% of all the fact check requests are either about economy, election, security, and health. So these are the more, most prominent uh, topics where the fact check requests are coming from. Some less, uh, pr uh, topics, less prominent topics would be uh, equality, uh, religion, and uh, education. And uh, we, we see that some topics are easier to fact check than others. For example, if we, ch if we see that how many uh, fact check requests are coming from economy for economy, 130 post, and above, uh, uh, among these 130 posts, 68 are not fact check, 62 are fact check. So they're like 47% of economy related fact, uh, fact check requests are getting fact check. Uh, likewise, for health and foreign affairs, the percentage is high. But for equality and immigration, the percentage of uh, post getting fact check is not that significant, like 21% or 30%. We may say that maybe there are evidence required to fact check these requests is not high, or we can say that the people who care about this topic may be not that significant. I, I don't know, but we have to, we can look at that. Then what are the entities that people want to see fact check? Uh, the most common entity is person, like Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump. They are the uh, most uh, common entities which gets fact checked. And the left figure shows the distribution of sources which they provide in their fact check request. For example, uh, many fact check requests come from a source from alternative media, from uh, user generated content platforms, and from news or media, information media. Then uh, the second question is, what are the contributions from the crowd? So our uh, assumption was maybe the crowd probably don't give much argument. They just give maybe uh, the opinionated discussions and uh, relevant posts. But we found that that's actually not true. So they provide insightful arguments. They provide arguments with evidence. They provide uh, argument with judgment or inference without evidence as well. That's the most common um, type of contribution from the crowd. And sometimes they uh, seek clarification whether uh, the post is clear, what, what part of the post 
the, the poster is trying to fact check, and is this uh, verifiable or not. If we further go deeper for the argument part, we see that for the mostly true, half true, or false, for these kinds of flare, people provide more argument containing factual evidence. And for the flares or for the ratings, for example, unverifiable, please verify, partisan bias, they generally don't have much argument containing factual evidence. Okay. And likewise, for the uh, above flares, they are less opinionated, opinion or uh, argument containing opinion, but here we have more arguments containing opinion or judgment. You may ask, okay, it's a crowdsourcing effort, how much time it takes? So on average, it takes about seven days to get a request fact check in the political fact checking. And when they provide, uh, when they use sources, when they use evidences, these are the most uh, uh, top eight uh, sources we find they use as the evidence. PolitiFact, CNN, uh, factcheck.org, Wikipedia, and uh, whitehouse.gov, and et cetera. Okay. So we understand the a role for the crowd. What roles does the professionals play? Okay. Professionals, alongside with the crowd, they also provide evidence. They summarize the arguments and come up with a rating. They update the flair, they update the rating of a claim in case they get future evidence. Okay, so if something is marked as mostly false, maybe it become false or half true in future, it can become like that. They ask for clarification and one of the major tasks for them is to regulate the group, like keep the discussion on topic, maybe announce new events, and so on. Now, the last part, how automation can help scaling up the whole uh, kind of crowd-powered, crowd-source fact-checking effort. Uh, I was working on Claim Buster with Dr. Shen Kai Li in UT Arlington. So there our goal was to give an, uh, a document, try to find the checkworthy factual statements, one of the significant steps required for fact-checking process. So I believe that when, uh, when, a, when a crowd, when a member posts a fact-checking request, the moderator can use Claim Buster or similar tools to understand how the fact check request should be ranked. Which request should I give more resource to? Which one should come later? And then uh, we developed a small, small pilot study for argument classification. So as I said, uh, crowd provide arguments, sometimes based on evidence, sometimes without any evidence. Okay? For the moderators, it's important for them to analyze the arguments, which contains evidence. And we built a small uh, machine learning uh, supervised uh, tool that with 82% of accuracy can identify whether an argument contains uh, evidence or not. Please take this with a grain of salt because it's based on a small data set. So there are a lot of ways to improve the uh, model. Some other ways we can uh, automate the process is try to understand the stance the commenter is taking. When they provide argument for a fact check request, is the argument against the fact check request or for the fact check request, the stance of the particular comment towards the post? And of course, we can rank the comments whether they are offensive or not, whether they're relevant to the topic or not, and, some, and uh, of course, we can also solicit arguments from experts who has previously worked on other similar fact check requests. So with that, I will let my uh, collaborator Yusuf uh, continue from here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is my first time here. So I wasn't sure how many people from journalism will be here. So I uh, came with two of my outstanding students to make sure that I don't feel alone. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about the underlying theories and concepts and what made me interested in this study. So I studied uh, how media competes, so media competition, not computation. So I study media competition using a combination of economic, ecological, and social network theories. So when I look at the uh, problems of fact-checking websites and news websites, I um, look at the structure of the ecosystem where these websites live in. So the structure, by structure, I mean uh, the number of populations. Like as Dr. Uh, Menster uh, highlighted this morning, that only a small number of 
uh, websites or organizations are trying to fight with like billion websites uh, that are spreading misinformation or not accurate information. So how many websites are there that fact-checking websites are competing with uh, the size of the populations of different populations like misinformation population and accurate information population? and the relationship between them, like it's cooperative or competitive, because we know some of the mainstream media also help spread misinformation. Uh, and the amount of resources available. So there are like a billion websites. How much time uh, regular users spend on fact-checking websites and how much time they spend on misinformation websites. As we scroll through Facebook, it's very likely that you will go through some of the misinformation, there will be clickbait, so there is pro the probability is very high that you will click some of those uh, links. So uh, overall, I see the problem of fact-checking websites as an ecological problem. Uh, so uh, what is missing in the entire discussion of finding a sustainable uh, fact-checking model is, I think, is uh, ecological. We do not, I don't know, uh, uh, I may not be true that we do not reflect enough about the shift that took place, especially when we talk about the model, sustainable model. Uh, we are still trying to excel with the mass media model that is not working anymore. So what changed? Uh, what changed is the number of sources of information. We used to have like scarce information. Only a small number of media organizations would control what content will be out there, what will be edited, and what will be published and also the flow of information. It used to go from like the institutions to the media to the people and not the other way around. The other way flow was like very little if none. Uh, also the, uh, then uh, as I said like most information, most fact-checking organizations, news organizations, they are actually trying to build on their mass media model because it was so powerful and they made so much money, they were monopoly, so they were like super rich. And I sometimes tell, say like our college, like journalism is like the uh, spoiled child of a rich parent. So you know, we don't, I mean our parents are gone, and mass media model is gone and we don't know how to survive. That's, the, that's our biggest struggle. So my uh, understanding from my six years of my uh, research and eight years of my work experience, uh, I think that there must be a way uh, to come up, uh, there must be a way to, to fix this problem and, and that must be in the theories of uh, like ecology and social, social networks. Uh, in other words, like you cannot fight like a tank with stick. Uh, it doesn't work because like 100 websites cannot fight 1 billion website. That's not possible. So there must be a way to do it. So that is what interested me in this study. Uh, so the very first step that we took here is like when they, uh, what uh, Naimul gave me the uh, idea of, uh, I mean, uh, Reddit fact checking thread. I looked at it. I said, okay, th it, it looks interesting because, you know, in ecological, uh, in, in an ecosystem, uh, it's the community, right? So they're not be, they should not, the control should be like decentralized, not in one hand. It, there should not be like only professionals who would make all the decisions. There should be, and uh, like, a, there must be a network way to fix this problem. So we identified the key players in our community that are professionals, and we identified uh, the crowds, although we did not define crowd very well, we're working on it. And then, and then the role that automation played. So uh, that's the entire thing that, uh, I mean, we have identified so far. And I think it will sow the seed of like really good studies. If we can continue this, we can keep working on this, then uh, like there may be a sustainable model someday. Uh, I strongly believe. Thank you. Yusuf for a great framing.
I think uh, that crowds are certainly important, as you'll see. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, so, I want to talk today about uh, a platform that we invented at the University of California, Berkeley, but a little bit of framing to begin with. The democratization of publishing has been far outpacing the democratization of content editing and review. As a result, there's a heightened possibility for low quality news to spread to millions who are lacking the skills to distinguish low from high quality news. And consequently become susceptible to distorted conceptions of reality. And at the same time, those who are more discerning are becoming more and more wary of all kinds of news. <clears throat> so I've been teaching a course at the University of California, Berkeley now for about four years. And it's a course called Sense and Sensibility in Science that attempts to bring scientific processes into decision making. And one of the main concepts from this course is that we try to get it to be as applicable to the real world as possible. So last year we invented a new project for our students, about 120 of them, uh, that was news centric. So we asked our students to scour the web uh, and looking for articles and look for evidence of either exceptional use or flawed use of the course concepts. Uh, and this, this worked really well and we've been wondering of, about how we can expand the scope of that project. How can we take it beyond the confines of a classroom? How can we incorporate uh, process checking into uh, group decision making? So when Saul Perlmutter, Nobel Prize winning physicist and uh, the founder of SSS, the course that I teach, uh, met up with one of our panelists from yesterday, Nick Adams, and learned about the Text Thresher platform, uh, a collaboration was born at UC Berkeley. Uh, we had a team of scientists, journalists, developers, and designers all come together to envision and create Public Editor, which is a mass collaboration software uh, designed to organize critical thinking efforts of crowds into generating a signal of credibility for news. Um, and so Public Editor is unique in two primary ways. First, it uses scientific process checking. And the second is its focus on word and phrase level annotation. Let's start with process checking. So scientific process checking is unique from fact checking. Now, the, the issue here is that when we're looking at quality of news, we're not just interested in the factual content of claims, but we're also interested in how these individual content units are synthesized into a broad framework. Now, fact checking certainly has a place. Uh, you can use it to corroborate or refute many claims. But it also has limitations. First, fact checking requires an external validation from a, from a canonical literature. Second, as Bill Adair pointed out yesterday, fact checking is only quick when humans have already evaluated the truth value of claims in the days and weeks prior. Process checking, on the contrary, draws from the hundreds of years of work of scientists uh, in evaluating new theories as they come out, so evaluating the veracity of new discoveries. And so when we're talking about process checking, it, it has several benefits. First of all, this results in a more independent judgment of news claims insofar as process checking draws its judgments from the evidence and reasoning presented within the article itself. And uh, process checking is also apolitical. Uh, exactly because it focuses on the sort of mechanistic explanations that are, have been shown, unlike rote knowledge, so we're talking about mechanistic explanations that show, that have been shown 
to increase knowledge across political and cultural divides. So the second part of what makes public editor unique is that we're focusing on word and phrase level annotation. Word and phrase level annotation has multiple benefits, one of which is to reduce bias. So uh, let's take an example. If I were to give you an article and I told you that this article, the exact same article was from the Huffington Post and then I told you that same article was from Breitbart, you would have vastly different judgments about that article even if everything in that article is the same. So we're making judgments about articles partly as a result of our biases and also we're making these judgments before we even read the content of an article. We're rejecting articles before even reading them and that's a perfect example of confirmation bias. Uh, now, one of the benefits of process checking is that by asking folks to annotate things specifically, asking them to look at pa passages, sentences, and phrases within an article, we're decontextualizing. They no longer have that contextual information of whether we're looking at Breitbart, they don't know about um, authors or publishers or anything. And so they're forced to make more accurate judgments. The second uh, important feature of specific annotation is that it's really useful in the AI ML sphere. Uh, so machine learning is fantastic and it's doing a great job now of starting to look at higher level article structural issues such as authors, bylines, publishers, but it still lacks the nuance to be able to evaluate the specific sentences and phrases within an article. Now, the specificity of data that we are gathering from our volunteers at Public Editor um, really allows us to generate rich training data for uh, AI and uh, ML and supervised learning applications that we can, we can build later on. And the last part is of annotating specifically is that one of the, one of the biggest goals here is to also just improve media literacy. And by having people focus on the exact structure and phrasing of articles, we go beyond just the truth value of claims and start to build in some educational aspects about the structure. But I'll get to that in a moment. So I've given you a little bit of motivation for what sets Public Editor apart, but now let's think about how it all comes together. It is a platform after all. I'd like to discuss three main components. So first, the training and the credibility concepts. Second, our users and our interfaces. And last, how we put it all together and aggregate a credibility score. So the credibility concepts, we're using about 150 credibility concepts at the moment. Many of these concepts, such as correlation and causation, or uh, the look elsewhere effect, or blind analysis, are all derived from the SSS course. And the rest were compiled by our interdisciplinary team. So together, these concepts provide a set of lenses for examining the news that are spanning, uh, that span the domains of scientific thinking, argumentative fallacies, psychological biases, and journalistic practices. How are we training our uh, citizen science volunteers? So training is essential because we want these volunteers to perform a careful analysis. Right now, we are training our volunteers in the concepts using a two-part approach, which I can talk more about later if you want. Uh, but in short, the first step is where that we're using a set of readings and animated demonstrations uh, to give a theoretical framework to our citizen science volunteers. And second, we're having them engage in deep iterative practice and comparing their judgments to that of a gold standard. Once users reach that gold standard, those evaluations get incorporated into the credibility score. Now, Public Editor is designed to allow users to increase in their level of engagement over time. So someone might start and they'll just be a reader. They're gonna be a consumption. Uh, they're just gonna consume our scores. And then as they progress in engagement, they're gonna to go to a flagger, uh, to a specialist, and then finally to a generalist, AKA veteran contributors. Let me give you a brief sense for what these different roles do, and then we can look at how it all comes together. 
So readers are just consumers. They're going to be looking at our credibility icons on a browser interface. And they can also expand that to see the specific indicators that the public editor community has identified as either erroneous or excellent. Flaggers are readers who report suspicious articles to us, to, to public editor, uh, and then we will then send it out to more of the community. And they do this again using a, um, a customized version of the Hypothesis web interface for those of you who know Hypothesis. Now, specialists are the staple of public editor. Uh, they do most of the tagging that goes into the credibility score and uh, they look at articles at a very specific level. And finally, generalists, aka I'm going to call them veteran contributors. Those of you who read the paper, uh, we call them generalists in the paper. Um, so veteran contributors are those who are trained in many, many concepts and are able to evaluate entire articles uh, looking for suspicious content with respect to the concepts that they're trained in. So how does this all come together? Well, I want to take you through a quick run through of what it might look like from start to finish for a single article. Let's suppose a, a, a reader is just looking through her Google News feed and she sees an article that says use of Advil is related to autism. Uh, she notices that this article doesn't have a public editor credibility icon next to it and clicks on it and, and thinks this is a little bit suspicious. So she opens her browser interface uh, and checks a box that sends the article to us. This is where the evaluation begins. So we take that article then and send it to a team of generalists who are going to look at the article at a large scale and glance through it. And let's say the generalists is fine that the article um, has a few paragraphs that seem to suggest that the author conflated correlation with causation. Now, the generalists, the paragraphs that the generalist has highlighted have, they will then be sent uh, to a team of specialists. Now, these specialists will examine just those paragraphs in detail. And let's say that they find um, so a perfectly plausible example that we've seen is the specialist might find that on sentence two of that paragraph, there was evidence that the author conflated correlation with causation while also failing to provide a plausible mechanism for the causation. So now those speci uh, the labels of those specialists, because all of the specialists in our community kind of agree with this, uh, will then get combined into a credibility score. So the credibility score, what is important when you're trying to generate a credibility score? From our perspective, the most important thing is trust from the community. And the key to generating community trust is transparency. So if a reader wants to see everything that goes into our credibility score, they can just click on it, and it'll expand, and they'll be able to see uh, all the ratings and concepts uh, that come together into that credibility score. So there's no black box algorithms here. It's all completely open. Um, while we think Public Editor has the potential to change the landscape of discourse and change the way in which we evaluate news and also raise uh, the media literacy of the public, uh, we understand that we're not ready yet. Uh, we've made substantial progress, but more iteration and changes are required before we can roll it out to the public. So let me give you a sense for what we've done and where we need to go. What have we done? We've compiled a set of interdisciplinary credibility concepts. We've built a citizen science annotation platform. We have designed flows for score generation. And we've built an initial community of college students and beta testers. What we still have to do is test out our online training interfaces. We've already tested live lectures with college students, uh, but we want to launch our entire online interface to students and beta volunteers. We need to build in gamification not just to get people to rate articles, but to consider engaging with the public editor community as a fun activity so that they can build discourse and dialogue into the critical evaluation of news. 
And last, we need to build supervised learning uh, that will guide and help our citizen science volunteers. And as we start to generate more data from our users, we'll be able to start uh, training AI to help us with this task. Um, so in, in conclusion, this is a brief summary of what we're doing at Berkeley with Public Editor, which is a citizen science platform that's trying to bring both uh, raise the quality of news, but also raise media literacy <coughs> amongst the public. And uh, the, the real goal with Public Editor, as I've mentioned before, is to have not just a credibility icon that tells you whether or not a news article is, is good, but to have something that journalists and editors, um, everyone involved, uh, has a standard which they can aspire to and adhere to. That's all I have. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can get this interface to work. Um, I'm, I will need uh, the interface to... All right, it's probably in a different place. Uh, I was prepared to say good morning, but I think it's uh, good afternoon. And um, I know that uh, I'm standing right between you and your lunch. So I will try to make it uh, worth your while because I have something interesting to tell you about. Um, uh, quickly, a show of hands. Uh, how many people have heard about the Pizzagate uh, scandal? All right, I, I thought that there isn't anybody who did not raise their hand. So I'll, I'll tell you about a tool we have dis uh, uh, developed uh, called Twitter Trails. But before I tell you the truth, uh, a little uh, advertisement from uh, your local sponsor. If you like this conference, if you like this discussion, we are running a, a special track at the World Wide Web uh, in Lyon next, uh, um, next uh, April. And it's not that Evanston is not bad, but come to Lyon. I think you will have a great time. So the deadline for submissions are January 5th. So. Um, let me tell you a little bit uh, about how we uh, you know, confront usually suspicious information. Uh, you get a message like that, it is on Twitter, and suddenly, as you may have read in the New York Times article, there is an explosion of people really upset with uh, what uh, really happens. Is this true? And you would like to know the answer, whether something like that is true. Uh, you're looking back and you say, well, there is a little bit of propaganda. Yeah, um, I happen to have the... Uh, you know, honor, I would say, that uh, back in 2005, I started worrying a lot about that. And I wrote an article that, for the first time, I think in any computer science uh, journal had the title propaganda, uh, had the word propaganda in its title. What I was finding was that people could compromise the uh, search results of Google by uh, creating what I call mutual admiration societies. Doesn't matter exactly how it works. But what it matters really is that there is a propagandistic network that fools Google, and through Google would fool you. I started worrying about that. Um, nothing major happened. At that time, it was impossible to believe that Google would ever make a mistake. And so not only that, but the system I had developed in order to find the propagandist behind that was using the backlinks. Google probably did not uh, like that. So the year after, Google did not allow backlinks to be reported in its API. A similar experience, I think, that uh, Jonathan uh, had with Facebook a couple days ago. So, but we did not worry. We knew that uh, people are smart and they can uh, do um, things better. Anyway, social media come in. And like many other uh, researchers, I'm very interested in whether you can predict elections. The, the word is that you can predict elections. I don't want you to be in any kind of urgency to, to know the answer. No, you cannot predict elections uh, using social media. And the reason is simple. I have it like a theorem. If it was possible to predict elections with social media, there is enough interest to fool up the social media so you cannot predict the uh, elections. You get it? 
It's an uncomputability theory on predicting elections. But as I was looking for this data, I started looking at a special Massachusetts elections in 2010. Senator Ed Kennedy had died, and his seat was very important because if the Democrats got the seat of uh, Ed Kennedy, they would be filibuster proof. If the Republicans would get it, they would be able essentially to stop uh, the uh, affordable care. It was like a big deal, but this is Massachusetts. I mean, who would believe that uh, Massachusetts would not uh, elect, a, elect a, a Democrat? Well, started collecting the data, as I said, to see whether you can predict uh, the data. It's a very interesting, uh, predict elections, very interesting story on its own. We started seeing a bunch of foul play. We actually found three different ways in which there were different groups who were trying to mess up the information that was uh, uh, eventually getting to voters, not only to Twitter, the data we were collecting was in Twitter, but also in Google. So the first thing that we discovered was what we call a Twitter-enabled Google bomb, essentially using Twitter to send search results very high up on Google. Uh, Google was the search engine of choice. Twitter was only viewed by 10%. So it was a very effective way to do that. To their credit, both Twitter and Google responded to that. Twitter took out the uh, uh, ability to repeat the tweets all the time, which was creating the uh, enabling of the Google bomb. And Google took out the real uh, time search results, which was what the Google bomb was about. There was a second technique, which we named um, Twitter bomb. Twitter bomb. Uh, well, it's just like you know, you're flooding people with the same piece of information, and you're sending only to those people who want to hear your message and then amplify it. It was kind of upsetting, but what it was more upsetting was how it was used in the future. Nevertheless, I have to say that this paper had a you know, good effect. We, it was the initial paper that helped us start to launch the Twitter trails. And on the audience of that day, my good friend uh, Phil Mentor was in who you know, came and talked to me after that and said, we need to do something about that. They worked on Truthy, and we worked on Twitter trails. So today, you will hear more about both of those. Uh, what was the annoying thing, however, was that the technique that, in case you wonder, there was a group of Iovan Republicans who were messing up with the Massachusetts elections, you know, an out-of-state group that uh, they had actually a, a history of messing up elections uh, or um, trying to create propaganda. Anyway, what uh, we uh, found was that the technique with which the Facebook uh, ads were compromised was identical to the Twitter bomb we had seen on Twitter. Briefly, you create fake accounts, you create the target message, and then you infiltrate the group by getting your fake accounts to befriend those who feel very passionate about your topic. And at some point, you're sending your vitriolic message, and you let the community do the work for you. Those who are really angry about that will spread the message. You can then delete your account, go into hiding, and it's like you never existed. Uh, the uh, you know, journalists at the other end, they see all this anger, and they, way they say, you know what? happened. Well, that's what had happened. So we could have avoided, but we didn't. We were not all paying attention. Being a computer scientist, I know that a journalist would like us to come up with an answer like that. OK, you guys, you are playing with code. Tell us which is the name of the website we could go and where is the button to click to give you the answers. All right. I'm not going to give you exactly like that, the answer, but I'll tell you how as journalists, you could make your life a little easier in discovering um, how a rumor spreads on Twitter. So Twitter Trails was um, uh, the product we developed. Uh, after Phil's um, uh, painful experience with Truthy, I thought of actually telling you my very little uh, part of pain. Um, as soon as Twitter Trails, the, the project eventually led to Twitter Trails, was funded, we became target by uh, Senator uh, Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, who listed our project uh, as uh, one of the waste of money. Because you know, they thought that to trust or not to trust the, week, uh, the tweets, that's the question. There is this kind of very seriously written, but apparently ironic thing. Like, are you serious? You want to even tell if something is true or not? Coming from a politician, you know, that has extra validity. I am afraid. Um, the good um, uh, congressman I never met, but I hope at some day to, to, to meet him. So 
Twitter Trails allows you to start from a tweet that you find suspicious, and then you lot a, a request for a story um, investigation, and in a few minutes it will come back and will tell you all it knows about, about that. And some of the things that you might be asking is, uh, well, something that might be a little funny, whether some newspaper was confusing Trump with uh, his uh, alter ego at uh, Saturday Night Live, um, uh, something that uh, President Trump himself said uh, about uh, wiretapes in Trump Tower. Is that true? Um, that uh, the um, Hillary State Department lost $6 billion. Now we're talking money. Oh, no. Ben canceled five, high, $500 billion in error. Half a trillion dollars were hiding somewhere. And of course, the Pizzagate story that got our attention. We have about 550 stories we have investigated, and I'll tell you um, how this is uh, working. Um, we are investigating stories. We start with a set of keywords that they try to capture all the set of relevant information uh, regarding some rumor spreading. And we start usually with one tweet. You know, we give uh, Twitter trails this tweet and we say, okay, here is what we want to investigate. In this case, we go after the tag Pizzagate and we try to see what uh, has happened. Um, as a journalist, looking at a rumor going, what you would like to know? We thought that you probably want to know some of the facts, like who originated the story? That is, who wrote the first post about that? Because that might tell you something about how the story started. When was the story burst? You know, uh, I think in your lingo is when it broke, uh, how it, people started paying attention. Who in particular, or who was the group that was uh, responsible for this kind of uh, burst of propagation? How the timeline goes, you know, is it something that broke and then went down? Is it still kind of lurking? It has uh, died or it's still uh, propagating? Who are the main propagators? Are there any particular accounts or particular groups that are doing this kind of propagation? And we're using a particular type of graph we call the core retweeting graph. I'll tell you in a moment what this is. Is there any doubt in the propagation? Are there any uh, tweets that they indicate doubt in what they're being propagated? And finally, who are the main actors? Who are the uh, main uh, kind of accounts who seem to be community leaders in this kind of propagation? I was getting ready to show you the live. I'm not sure if the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, which browser was it? Was it? It's not there anymore, right? So I will just give you the, uh, the demo in, uh, I, I had prepared for both cases. If the live demo did not work, I'll show you. When you get into Twitter trails, what you see is a little briefing of the story that tells you you know, a starting point of what is it investigated, when the investigation started, and so on and so forth. Uh, then you will see what we call the propagation graph. This is a graph that will tell you in bubble points uh, when the story kind of got more attention. So as you are uh, looking here, it seems like at that point is when the story started getting more attention. Uh, the highest visibility point, nevertheless, happens to be this point which, surprise, surprise, comes from a Turkish journalist. Um, a Turkish journalist, and how did he find out about all of this? Well, if you move the cursor in all of this bunch of tweets that happened just before the Turkish journalist started propagating the rumor, you would find that it was a Turkish-speaking troll that after, you know, uh, spoke Turkish in a while, started speaking in English. And I'll show you what the troll looked like, you know. Uh, 95 kind of uh, troll uh, postings uh, upsetting the Turkish press about what's really happening in America. And why did this catch up uh, in Turkey? The Turkish government was in really uh, hard position at that time because there were reports that they were abusing uh, Syrian kids that they were taken as um, uh, refugees and you know, people were reasonably upset about how the government was handling things. And the good, uh, 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 you know, troll started saying, oh, you're there talking about what they do in Turkey. Wait to see what they do in America. And so that's what uh, our uh, good uh, uh, Mehmet Ali O'Neill 
was saying, you know, oh, they're talking about us. Look at what Hillary Clinton is doing in America. This is where you find, and this internationalized the pizza gate in ways that I don't think we had, uh, we had discovered. You see, what I find interesting about Twitter trails is that even though there have been so many articles that have been written, I suspect that um, when you came to this talk, you wonder, OK, is there anything new to learn about Pizzagate? Well, there are some new things that you can find. You can also find who started the rumor. Well, it turns out uh, the Washington Post and New York Times wrote that it started on the 7th of November. It turns out, actually, that it started on the 6th of November by a troll. When we were writing the paper, we saw the troll still alive but inactive. I just checked uh, yesterday, and now uh, Twitter has actually uh, taken it down, maybe because they wrote, uh, they read our paper. So in the middle of the night, on November 6th, at 2.34 a.m., started writing the first tweet, giving pictures of supposedly the basement of that pizza parlor that had proof. And as you can see from this timeline, for a long time, it was not getting that much attention. There were several people uh, which turns out to be an echo chamber that they were trying to get the attention, but it was not getting too much attention. When the uh, rumor got in, uh, internationalized, suddenly everybody was paying attention, and that was happening later on. Then we tried to recreate the core retweeted network. Uh, Phil was showing you what the, the retweeted network is, is looking like. The core retweeted network tries to pick up the most important nodes in the communication that's happening. What do I mean by that? Let's say that uh, two of us uh, are seeing somebody tweeting something, and we both tweet this person. Well, we just created an in interesting node. You know, we kind of say that this node may have more visibility because more people in the audience follow this. And then we see yet another um, Twitter, and we both retweet those. We just created a connection between these two nodes. Essentially, we say that according to us, the audience, these seem to be visible and they seem to be presenting the same message. As a result, you get kind of the most valuable nodes, the kind of the leaders in the community, and eventually you can see them in the way they are polarized. One of the simplest things is to see polarization in the US elections. And you can see you know, the blue guys and the red guys, and uh, usually there will be a small connection between the two of them. Would you like to know what the Pizzagate core tweeted network looked like? It looked like that. It is a big green you know, blob right now uh, that it says that there is no doubt in what people were saying. They were all agreeing. And uh, the central node is a twin. Um, her name is Pettibone. I think she writes. Uh, she writes uh, fiction for teenagers who thought that this is the biggest thing that she has ever seen. And she started, she wrote 90 uh, to 100 tweets uh, pushing the story that this is a huge uh, um, conspiracy that um, they tried to cover uh, Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party. You couldn't tell otherwise, but here, you know, if I had the interface, I could show you. We can automatically, uh, we can automatically also figure out the characterization of these groups by the little clouds that you see at the end. We take the profiles that the people who are in the code retweeted networks use when they present themselves, and then we take the most common words that they appear in their profiles. So we let them tell us who they think they are. In this case, this blob has as most common words MAGA, that's make America great again, Trump, truth, love, conservative, proud, Christian, God, America, you get the point. Uh, and it has almost all the nodes. The second group has 16 nodes. It's another uh, also conservative father, deplorable. They're just not part of the big group. And then we have the pictures, the images that people were, um, were using at that time. If you go right now to this story and you start scrolling through the pictures, you will see many are missing because they were really disgusting. There were lots of uh, amputation and blood and stuff like that, and Twitter has started taking down all of this. So um, you can go, we have a blog, uh, and you can read more about uh, what we have uh, done. And uh, in the interest of time, I will stop here and take any questions later on. Thank you.
great. Thank you, gentlemen. Really interesting presentations. Um, like I five minutes for five minutes for questions. Okay, right. and, then, uh, and then we have lunch, and you can talk. We'll be, to we'll these be, since there we're standing well. between you and lunch, we'll be yeah. quick. Um, so let me um, let me throw out a couple of um, of thoughts here, and then we'll we'll open it up. Um, one um, uh, one question is, um, you all we're listening. We've heard a lot about fact checking um, today and yesterday, and. Um, it seems to me, in some ways, it's a little bit like play, playing a game of whack-a-mole. And I wonder if, uh, and people seem to be falling into different buckets. And so here we have folks like you who are like, is it, is it correct or is it not? Is the process correct or not? Or can we follow the trail? Um, and so I guess my question is to, to that, and I'll just ask questions and then we can riff on this. Um, does that lead? Where do you see the fact-checking um, world, you know, sort of falling into? In what buckets do you see falling into? And where do you, where are you most op optimistic um, and not? So that's my first question. The second one is, what can journalists do to contribute to this conversation more than they're already doing? And what else can um, computer scientists do? Are we, can we form a um, consumer internet protection movement because we're talking about crowdsourcing. And then thirdly, um, looking ahead, many of the conversations we've had um, in the last two days have been text-based. Some of the stuff that we're seeing um, on my, in my department at Stanford is about fact-checking video. Um, P, uh, we now have the, tech, the technology that literally can stuff words into YouTube video mouths, um, as well as yesterday listening to sound. So um, perhaps um, if folks have questions along those lines, we can we can um, bring them together. But um, maybe we can just dive in there. Uh, I want to talk about the optimism and contribution of journalists. So I'm going to focus okay. on these two. So the fact that there are so many people here working hard on their research means there is a niche. Uh, and niche means opportunities. So I'm very optimistic that something is going to come up pretty soon. If not soon, sooner than it will come up. Because we all feel the need that there must be a way to fight misinformation. Uh, the contribution of journalists, that's the key, I think, in this entire discussion. Because one thing that uh, we do not realize is journalists, we call them fact checkers, but they do not have the information. They collect, we collect information from multiple places, multiple persons, multiple organizations. And then we verify them, and then we present them. So that's our role. We don't have any information. We cannot make up information. Uh, that means we are dependent on the institution. So I think here is the journalist's role in terms of uh, like networks. Uh, they should be, there is a like, structural hole there. And there should be the bridge between those people who are looking for information and who have the information. And they're, they're going to be the switchers in network. They're not going to be the fact creators. They cannot, because they don't have the facts. Yeah. Um, I, I actually think that's a, a good point that I want to riff off of, in that some of what I think we're coming from is that perspective of, yeah, you have a set of information out there in the world. Uh, but first of all, who's going to believe this information? Uh, yesterday's conversation brought up the idea that some people trust fact-checking more than others, right? And just like some people trust journalists more than others. So can journalists, and maybe you can speak on this as a journalist, can journalists um, adhere to a set of practices? Can they bring in the sense of scientific rigor into journalism so that anyone who wants to track the trail down can do so? Uh, or for a just an average consumer, they can say, well, I, I get that you're tentative about this, right? That's the beauty of science is that it is tentative. We put things out there with a certain degree of confidence and we're searching for when we're wrong. So can we do the same in journalism, that we put things out there and leave it open for the public to, to help? Because journalists can do so much research and then they have to publish. Um, 
but can they publish with that tentativeness and that openness uh, for the crowd, the public, the readers to come back and say, well, you might have missed something here, or your process is slightly off over there. And I, I will, I think we happen to be sitting in uh, the order of reduced optimism. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think, Anne, you just brought a very important point. I think we're being at the stage in which we are about to be outgunned by our technology that we are creating. And if it is so hard to debunk this kind of uh, written statements, even though some of them can be, you know, um, be done with artificial means, and uh, thank God for all of the fact checkers and everything. When we get into this propaganda that comes through the made up videos, that they make up a completely unrealistic world that looks true, and given the little amount of attention we can pay on anything in our lives, I'm afraid that people will opt for the easy solution. However, people have not done particularly well in their lives when they believe lies. And I think what we will see is that those people who actually are more skeptical and are more trying to find out what is the truth will be more successful in life and we will be feeling sorry for those that they let essentially their um, thinking laziness to take them down. So do we need to hear more from computer scientists about how technology is letting us down? And, and I put it in the sort of, do we need a, a Ralph Nader of, to, to protect the internet? Well, I can probably uh, add to his and is it not you, very and is it optimistic views. So I mean, I have that too. I mean, I, I was, because we're in this field, right? So uh, the, the scientific thing, I mean, that was yesterday all day. They were talking about precision journalism, how Phil Meyer brought up the idea of precision journalism, how we can apply scientific methods like statistical methods to get good stories and verify information. Uh, the, the thing is we have also have to realize when science is growing so fast, technology is growing so fast, the anti-science people are getting stronger. I mean, they're stronger than any time. Like some, before like last 50 years. So that means those people, I mean, I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling, but I'm going to say that it doesn't matter how scientific we are, how many different ways we present our facts, they're not going to believe. Yeah, um, I mean, just to interject really quickly, I think when I speak about science, if I wasn't clear earlier, it's not so much that science gives us a set of facts we should believe. I'm not saying that at all. Um, even though I am a scientist by training, I, it's more so that uh, there is a, a type of dialogue in science, right? There's a set of procedures, and I'm not saying that journalists should use those procedures, um, that's just part of it. I'm saying that the public needs to be made aware of those procedures so they can analyze journalism with those sets of procedures. So, I, you know what, I uh, thank, I, this panel has been great. I've been really interesting takes on this, um, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.